30,000 jobs destroyed, $8.8 billion demanded, and the creator of the world's most valuable programming language forced out of his own company, all for 10 cents per share. In April 2010, James Gosling watched helplessly as his new corporate owners turned him into a powerless puppet. The man who invented the language that runs on billions of devices worldwide was offered a pay cut and stripped of all authority over his own creation. This is the story of how Silicon Valley's most important programming language became the center of the most devastating corporate betrayal ever recorded. A dying company losing $100 million every single month. A 10 cent bidding war worth $7.4 billion. And a legal battle so tense, it lasted 11 years and reached the Supreme Court. While families lost everything, the corporate raiders walked away with hundreds of millions, only to face the biggest legal humiliation in tech history. If you want to know how Oracle's greed destroyed one of tech's greatest companies, hit that like button and subscribe to Money Legends. By 2009, Sun Microsystems was hemorrhaging $100 million every single month. The company that had revolutionized computing was dying a slow public death. Stock prices had collapsed 80% in just one year. Once worth tens of billions, Sun was now desperately hunting for a buyer before complete financial ruin. This was the same company that created Java, the programming language that made it possible for code to run anywhere on any device. Billions of smartphones, computers, and servers worldwide depended on it daily. But Sun had made a fatal mistake. They gave Java away for free. While the entire tech industry built fortunes on Sun's innovation, Sun itself couldn't figure out how to make money from their own creation. The dot-com crash had shattered their hardware business, and despite Java running the modern world, the revenue never followed. By late 2008, the vultures were circling. Two massive tech corporations saw an opportunity to acquire Java and Sun's other technologies for pennies on the dollar. The first was IBM a company known for ruthless efficiency and aggressive cost-cutting. They'd been courting Sun for months. The second bidder was more surprising. Oracle, primarily a database company, had never shown interest in hardware or operating systems. But Oracle CEO Larry Ellison understood something others had missed. Java was about to become the foundation of mobile computing, and whoever controlled it would control the future. IBM offered $9.40 per share for Sun Microsystems. Oracle offered $9.50, a difference of 10 cents. For months, IBM has been the clear frontrunner. They'd spent countless hours in negotiations, promising Sun's executives they would preserve the company's open source culture and protect its 33,000 employees. But IBM stocks kept stalling. Antitrust regulators worried about the merger creating a monopoly in enterprise computing. The delays were killing Sun financially, burning through cash reserves at a terrifying pace. Then Oracle's Larry Ellison made a move. Ellison had initially only wanted Sun's software assets. He didn't care about their servers, storage systems, or manufacturing facilities. But when IBM entered the picture, he changed his mind. Ellison realized that if IBM acquired Sun, Oracle would lose access to Java forever. Java powered the foundation of Oracle's entire middleware business, worth billions in annual revenue. Oracle's software products were built on top of Java. Losing control of it would be catastrophic. So Ellison did something unprecedented. He offered to buy the entire company, not just the software. $7.4 billion in cash for everything Sun owned. The bidding war lasted just weeks. IBM, frustrated by regulatory delays and unwilling to match Oracle's aggressive timeline, suddenly withdrew their offer. Sun's board was stunned. Their backup plan had become their only option. On April 20, 2009, Oracle and Sun announced the acquisition. Financial media called it the deal of the decade. Larry Ellison declared Java the single most important software asset we have ever acquired. Sun's employees celebrated. They thought they'd been saved by a software giant who understood their technology's true value. Within months of Oracle's acquisition, the architects of Sun's greatest innovations found themselves trapped in a corporate nightmare. James Gosling had spent 26 years at Sun Microsystems, rising from researcher to chief technology officer of Java. Developers worldwide revered him as the father of the language that had transformed modern computing. At Sun, his word on Java's direction carried absolute authority. 
Oracle dismantled that authority piece by piece. My ability to decide anything at Oracle was minimized, Gosling later revealed. Oracle is an extremely micromanaged company. All of our authority to decide anything evaporated. His new role was humiliating. A glorified mascot paraded on stage to legitimize Oracle's control. Smile for the cameras. Read the prepared statements. Promote decisions made by executives who've never written a line of code in their lives. Then came the final insult. Despite his legendary status in Silicon Valley, Oracle offered Gosling a significant pay cut. The performance bonuses that had rewarded Sun's top engineers vanished overnight. The message was unmistakable. You're just another employee now. The exodus had already begun. Tim Bray, co-creator of XML, resigned in February 2010 before the acquisition was even finalized. Jonathan Schwartz, Sun's CEO, was forced out immediately. Kosuke Kawaguchi, who built the Hudson development tool, quit in April. Sun's greatest minds were fleeing Oracle's suffocating grip, one resignation letter at a time. On April 2, 2010, exactly one year after the acquisition announcement, Gosling reached his breaking point. He submitted his resignation with a cryptic blog post that spoke volumes through its silence. Just about anything I could say that would be accurate and honest would do more harm than good. Oracle had a proven playbook. After acquiring PeopleSoft, they cut 5,000 jobs. After buying Sybil Systems, another 2,000 workers were eliminated. Sun's 33,000 employees were next. Larry Ellison publicly promised, we're hiring, not firing. Behind closed doors, Oracle executives were planning the largest tech layoffs in Silicon Valley history. The cut began immediately. Even while Sun was bleeding money during the acquisition delays, Oracle forced them to announce 3,000 additional layoffs. Employees received the news through automated phone calls on a Friday afternoon. Oracle's strategy was surgical and ruthless. They identified every department with overlapping functions and eliminated the Sun's side entirely. Engineering teams that had spent decades building revolutionary technologies were dissolved overnight. The Apache Software Foundation, which had collaborated with Sun on open source projects for years, resigned in protest. They could see Oracle's true intentions. Sun's culture of openness and collaboration was being systematically destroyed. Even worse was what happened to Sun's crown jewel projects. Hudson, the popular development tool, was stripped away from its community and renamed Jenkins after Oracle claimed trademark ownership. The developers who had built it for free were suddenly told they couldn't use their own creation. Oracle executives wanted complete control over Sun's technology, how it was used, who could access it, and what the community could build with it. Industry analysts estimated Oracle would eliminate 15 to 16,000 Sun jobs, nearly half of the workforce. These were engineers, designers, and support staff who had dedicated their careers to Sun's mission of open computing. Entire campuses were shuttered. Sun's sprawling Menlo Park facility, where some of the Internet's foundational technologies were invented, was sold to Facebook. Decades of institutional knowledge walked out the door with pink slips. In August 2010, Oracle sued Google for $8.8 billion over 11,000 lines of code. That represents less than 0.1% of Android's entire code base. The lawsuit was amazing in its audacity. Oracle claimed that Google had stolen Java by using its application programming interfaces in Android without permission. These APIs were essentially instruction manuals that told programmers how to use Java's functions. Google's defense was simple. You can't copyright a programming interface any more than you can copy the alphabet. APIs were the basic building blocks that allowed software to communicate. Making them proprietary would cripple innovation across the entire tech industry. But Oracle saw billions of dollars in Android success and wanted their share. The legal arguments were complex, but the stakes were crystal clear. If Oracle won, they could demand licensing fees from every company using Java-compatible code. The entire open source movement would be under threat. Google had used Java's APIs to make Android familiar to the millions of developers who already knew the language. Instead of forcing programmers to learn completely new systems, Android let them use their existing Java skills. It was a smart business decision that helped Android become the world's most popular mobile operating system. Oracle's lawyers painted this as theft on an unprecedented scale. 
They argued that Google had deliberately copied Java's structure and organization, which represented years of creative work by Sun's engineers. The case bounced between courts for years. District judges sided with Google, saying APIs could be copyright. Appeals courts reversed those decisions, ruling that the structure of programming interfaces was creative expression worthy of protection. Tech giants across Silicon Valley watched nervously. The precedent would affect every piece of software ever written. Programming languages, operating systems, and web services all relied on shared interfaces and common standards. Oracle was willing to fight for over a decade to establish their control over these fundamental building blocks of computing. On April 5th, 2021, the Supreme Court delivered a 6-2 ruling that destroyed Oracle's entire case. The justices obliterated 11 years of legal strategy with a decision so definitive it left no room for appeal or interpretation. Google's use of Java's APIs, the court declared, was transformative fair use. The search giant had taken only what was necessary to allow developers to use their existing skills on a new platform. Android was building something entirely different that happened to speak the same language as Java. Oracle's reaction was bitter. They stole Java and spent a decade litigating, as only a monopolist can, declared their general counsel. The statement dripped with irony. Oracle worth over $200 billion was calling Google the monopolist. The tech industry erupted in celebration. Developers who had lived under the threat of API lawsuits for over a decade could finally breathe freely. The Supreme Court had protected the fundamental building blocks of software innovation. But the ruling meant more than just legal precedent. It was a complete repudiation of Oracle's vision for controlling software development. Larry Ellison had spent billions acquiring Java to become the gatekeeper of mobile computing. Instead, he'd become the villain in a cautionary tale about corporate overreach. James Gosling, now working at Amazon Web Services, was finally vindicated. The programming language he'd created to be open and accessible would remain exactly that. Oracle's attempts to lock it behind licensing fees and legal threats had failed spectacularly. The financial toll was massive. Oracle had spent more money on legal fees fighting Google than they'd ever made from Java licensing. Their lawyers had billed millions, while their reputation in the developer community crumbled. Even worse, the lawsuit had created the exact opposite of what Oracle wanted. Instead of establishing their control over Java, they'd proven they couldn't be trusted with it. The Java story revealed Silicon Valley's truth. Companies claiming to build the future are often the ones most willing to destroy it for quarterly profits. Innovation doesn't come from corporate boardrooms. It comes from passionate developers who believe technology should serve humanity, not shareholders. Drop a comment below, was Oracle right to fight for control, or should programming languages remain free for everyone? If this story of corporate greed shocked you, hit that like button and subscribe to Money Legends. We expose the hidden scandals behind the world's biggest companies. Our next video is right here. We think you'll love it.